We are going to get started. Lots of good seats available here down front. The closer you sit to the front, the closer you are to our door prize, which we will remind everyone is a bottle of Angel's Envy Kentucky Bourbon. This is the only cost to attending tonight. If you're here tonight, your name is in a raffle, you may win bourbon. If you're here tonight, though, we are also asking you to fill out the form in front of you. We have a very simple, short feedback form, and we'd just appreciate it if you let us know what you think, what you'd like to see more of, what you'd like to see less of. <coughs> this year, we're doing six angel education sessions. This is the fifth of six. It's a pretty ambitious uh, approach. Our hope is that it's a way to engage and develop the investor community in Northeast Ohio in a way that we haven't done previously. We want to make sure that it works and people like it. Our initial indication is that a lot of people have shown up, which is really good. Exits are something which are near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, the saying goes that if angel, uh, angel investors don't have exits, they are philanthropists, which is not the business uh, we're looking to be in. So uh, we're going to have some really interesting people on the stage here that have all driven and been part of successful efforts uh, to realize an exit. And I think the Q&A is going to be great. We look forward to hearing a lot of questions and comments from the group as well. So please do stick around till the very end when we will give away the Angel's Envy. Please do fill out your uh, survey form before you leave tonight. So we have one more event left on December 4th. It's going to be a different format, and it's going to be a larger group. It's going to be something of an open mic night where we're going to be asking our members, other investors in Cleveland, and entrepreneurs in Cleveland to stand up and to provide 60 seconds of the one thing everyone should know. That might be about exits. That might be about why their company failed, and if they had only changed one thing, it wouldn't have. We think it will be really interesting. We're going to have a little voting up and voting down to identify the, the top 10 insights there. And it's going to be an interesting way to get entrepreneurs, business people, and investors together uh, in the room, kind of the capstone of our uh, angel education sessions this year. So we hope you can all join us on December 4th. We want to acknowledge that all of these programs are made possible by the support of the Burton D. Morgan Foundation, which is a Hudson-based foundation all about entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship education, and they've seen the value in uh, creating the level of engagement that we have here today, and we appreciate that. We'd also like to acknowledge the North Coast Angel Fund Innovation Council. This is a group of about 15 local companies and organizations that support us, allowing us to put on events like this, our regular monthly member meetings, uh, and also bringing their intellectual horsepower, creating connections for our companies, uh, creating more opportunities for there to be innovation and engagement between the corporate community and our companies. These are the panelists. Presumably everyone has seen these names and faces because you received an email uh, and uh, came here tonight. You'll find that many of these entrepreneurs, although the common denominator is successful companies, very different paths, very different types of companies, very different timelines, and we hope that some of that nuance will come out in the conversation tonight. So the goals here for the night are, one, to provide a sense of what it takes to achieve an exit. Anyone who's been angel investing for any period of time has already realized it's a lot easier to write checks than it is to get checks back from companies. And individuals, they'll often just see the general news, the updates from the company, but oftentimes don't get a peek behind the curtain of what actually has to happen to put a company in a position to have a successful exit, and what has to happen to execute a process to have a successful exit. So we're hopeful that we'll create some visibility there that perhaps wasn't there uh, before. Part of that will also just be a little bit of a first person, what it looks like and feels like to be uh, part of that process because having been close to a couple of these I can say at least for myself it is a harrowing process it's not over until it's over it's terrifying that it's going to blow up right until the very last second uh, and although it's uh, satisfying and a lot of fun uh, it is it is not a uh, easy ride to be sure we also want to uh, talk about how to increase the likelihood of exit we think there's some things that can be done to increase your chances of being successful and also to increase your chances of having an earlier exit and then lastly, how to approach an exit that can, in fact, benefit uh, all of the shareholders. I think we've all seen and heard of 
situations where perhaps the investors get their money back, perhaps the last investors had a pretty sweet deal and there's just enough money to go through part of the liquidation stack. That's going to happen sometimes, but I think there are things that can be done and approaches by the board to make sure that it's an equitable situation when the time does come for an exit. Okay, so uh, a few initial thoughts, and I don't think this is going to be shocking to anyone. Most early stage investments are not successful. In most uh, seed stage ventures, investors will lose all of their money. The only way that that can turn into a successful investing approach is if the outcomes that are successful are outsized outcomes. So part of this needs to be thinking about what we need to do to achieve successful exits, which at its most simplest is great investing, right? So picking the right companies, getting in at the right times and valuations and deal structures, helping them operate and take advantages of opportunities to grow the company, and then executing on the exit itself. And I think we see a lot of opportunity to create value at the tail end of a process with uh, these companies. There are uh, many different types of exits and flavors. We'll talk about some of those tonight. Despite the headlines uh, about the outliers or even the outliers of the outliers, the average tech exit is not a $100 million exit, let alone a billion dollar exit. It's about $20 million. And even the exits that uh, occur when the acquirer is Facebook or Apple or Amazon, uh, more often than not are smaller exits. Now, to be sure, they all buy, uh, they all buy companies for hundreds of millions of dollars. But earlier today, when we were uh, just taking a look online and kind of marveling at the hundreds of billions of dollars of cash that Apple and Amazon and Microsoft have, and looking at uh, the exits that they've executed on over the past year, there are many small ones that most people here probably wouldn't have heard of. Uh, Apple buys RealFace for $2 million. They buy Gravana for $30 million. Uh, there's a, a GameSparks is bought by Amazon for $10 million. Cloudin is purchased by Microsoft for $60 million. That's really the bread and butter uh, exits that are out there. And for us as angel investors, we need to think about how we are uh, investing in companies so that uh, we can win, uh, not regardless of the outcome, but at least in a broader set of outcomes. Because as we talked about before, angel math is a little bit different than VC math. We don't necessarily put as much capital in. The rounds are not uh, quite as large. So we can have successful outcomes in smaller exits uh, than perhaps a VC would. We think that's something to keep in mind. So although it feels like we're tied to the mast of a sailboat, this is what about Bob, by the way. Uh, there are really a number of different ways to exit companies. Uh, there are different flavors of M&A. Some companies are interested from a strategic sense, others from a more financial sense. Uh, private equity is super active right now, and valuations are high even in the SaaS spaces, which traditionally uh, were not as hot uh, on a private equity side, although uh, IPOs are, are down overall because of the later stage equity financing and billion dollar funds that are supporting them. Most of us angels don't go into this contemplating IPOs. We're looking for traditional M&A uh, exits. So there's a lot of opportunities in terms of uh, how we exit. There's also a lot of opportunities on timing. This is not to say that an early stage investor can get out anytime they want, right? At the A round, the B round, the C round. But the opportunities do present themselves and you never know until you do. On one hand, you don't want to be that investor who sells out at the B round of Facebook. On the other hand, you want to be that investor that sells out of the B round of the other 10,000 companies that ultimately are not successful and don't go through exit. So you can have these opportunities. We've been presented with opportunities uh, as a fund to sell in some cases we've said yes, in some cases we've said no, but creating those opportunities uh, we think creates value for the early stage investors. Different flavors of what we receive in return to be sure, uh, but put this up here just to note that the ultimate dollar, whether it's a $50 million exit, a $100 million exit, is important, but it's just as important whether it's in cash or it's in stock, it's all now versus it's tied, uh, tied to a milestone. Perhaps there's some sort of earnout which may or may not be realized. Uh, we've had reasonable success with our exits that have had milestones tied to them, but we haven't always gotten there. And all things uh, equal, you want cash, you want it soon, and you want it unencumbered uh, and not tied to certain milestones. The North Coast experience has been tied to these 52 companies that we've invested in over the past decade. 
We've had four successful exits so far. There are another 34 companies uh, operating. And of the companies that are still operating, there are probably at least 10 situations where either they have licensed off a piece of their uh, business, they have, as in Streamlink's case, taken one of their products and sold it to a private equity-backed company, and many others where there have been verbal overtures, there have been term sheets, uh, letters of intent, and for various reasons, those do or do not come to fruition. So there's an interesting and growing body uh, of activity of us seeing uh, how these companies are presented with opportunities and understanding how they react. And at the end of the day, we would like to think that we're getting smarter, and as a community, we're getting smarter uh, by, that by understanding what it takes to grow a company to the point of exit and what it takes to navigate an exit process that we can better evaluate entrepreneurs early up front to determine whether or not they have the hard skills and soft skills to navigate that process successfully. So briefly, these are the four exits. I don't think we've ever presented them uh, in this way before. Uh, but what it shows is that the companies that have exited have raised as little as $3 million, as much as $100 million, exited for as little as $20 million. Uh, in the case of Assurex, had the potential to exit for up to $400 million based on milestones. Turns out that they mostly hit one of the milestones, missed another. So uh, the actual number was in the high twos, but that was the largest that we have so far. Uh, we're not able to share details on where OnShift is now, just with some developing news. Uh, but those of you who are in Fund One have received a check from us, so you know something was happening there with uh, OnShift, and we have uh, been bought out as part of a tri private equity transaction there. So it's, I think, an interesting uh, way to look at a cross-section of outcomes and to see some outcomes which are stellar, others which are encouraging, but this is very much the bread and butter of what we uh, see here. Uh, two of the M&A activities were to private one was to private equity, one was to, uh, two rather, were to publicly traded entities. So there's a wide variety of acquirers, but uh, as I mentioned before, with the large players of the Amazons and the Microsofts, uh, very few of those uh, companies are buying more than 10, 12 a year. So that means that the overwhelming majority of angel funded and venture capital funded exits are being uh, conducted by companies that many people in this room haven't heard of. Right, so there's a wide variety of potential acquirers out there, and some of the panelists that I'll be speaking later tonight sold their companies to uh, those types of acquirers. Okay. So Midwest cap tables, uh, it's not unusual for us to see 20, 30, 50 or more individual investors. And this gets back to one of the, the first point uh, I mentioned of trying to create visibility into what happens behind the scenes with an exit, because not every uh, angel investor is on the board or an advisor. Many hear about these exits via uh, an email, and you kind of never know how you're going to uh, find out about these. One example, that is my thumb, <laughs> on Friday, May 8th at 9.39 a.m. So I was at the Cleveland Clinic emergency room because my thumb was large, turning blue, and bleeding a little bit. And I was trying to do a little bit of uh, work and I got a text message from my friend Bob. So Bob is the CEO of uh, Ahology, a Cincinnati company that was doing well, uh, not a company that we were expecting to exit anytime soon. Uh, we had invested $450,000 on the Angel Fund, a million dollars on a North Coast Venture Fund, and it's always good to hear from Bob. And Bob simply said, hey, I've got some good news to share. Please call when you have a minute. So that was promising, right? You know, I, I didn't think that would be an exit, Turned out there was a letter of intent, a very serious uh, acquirer, publicly traded company that they knew. This was a partner of theirs that they had worked with over the years. So no exit, would, at no point when you have an LOI do you say there is a 90% chance this thing's gonna happen, right? There are a lot of reasons these deals can and do blow up. But it checked all the boxes as far as the two parties really know each other. There should be an appreciation of value. This is a real company with a balance sheet that acquires companies regularly. Now, it was very promising, and within 60 days, the company uh, was sold, and my thumb is just fine. So it was a, a good story, and we see a lot of these happening uh, like this. There are other cases like Assurex, where that was probably a year and a half process of them working with an investment banker, going through multiple financing stages, uh, working with a large publicly traded company, negotiating earnouts, where 
it was really a slow motion process where something like this happened relatively quickly. So one of the big existential questions I think we'll get into in some of our panel discussions are, are companies bought or are they sold? Uh, the answer is yes, no, and maybe, depending on who you talk to. Uh, I, I think there's a, a reasonable sense that people who believe companies are bought take the position of, hey, you've got to build a great company. There's no point financially engineering something, no point doing a road show before there's really a product there. Build a great company, have great metrics, people will want to buy you. On the other hand, you say, where are we? We're in, in clean. Most of the large publicly traded acquirers that would look at our companies are not in Cleveland, right? I mean, they're not in any one city. So we see that although, yes, you've got to build a great company, yes, you need to drive metrics and be heads down, you also need to identify potential acquirers relatively early, have relationships with your partners where you're communicating your value, understanding to which potential acquirers you could drive the most value, and partnering with those, uh, those players getting them close enough to you so that there's more likely to be opportunities for them to be uh, an acquirer. And also having your company as acquisition ready as it can be, meaning clean books and records. Ideally, you're at a point where you're large enough to have gone through uh, an audit. There's just a clean entity that can successfully go through diligence. Because it, one of the terrifying things is when a 25-person company has 25 people from an acquirer come in and conduct diligence over a two-week period because nothing gets done, and it's a lot easier to ask questions than it is to answer those questions. So we think there are a lot of things that companies can and should be doing, so that's why I'd say the answer to that is both. Can companies, are companies bought or sold? So with that, we're going to invite up our first panel uh, I'll have a handful plus set of questions that we'll ask them, and then we'll open questions up to the group. So our esteemed panel number one, please join us. Would you do the first introduction? So we are thinking and hoping that both mics are going to work for the duration. If they don't, we'll uh, shut one down. Uh, for expedience, we're just asking each of our panelists to give a quick introduction on themselves, maybe the company they sold, something interesting, and then we'll dive into the questions. Uh, Laura Bennett, uh, the founder, founder and the prior CEO of Embrace Pet Insurance. I exited last year, and the exit, exit was a little non-traditional in that my co-founder and I uh, left the company. I guess it just, no, there it is, it's on and off. Uh, the co-founder and I uh, uh, left Embrace uh, when um, our investors became owners. They decided that they would uh, like to run the company themselves. So after 14 years of running the company, time to, uh, to move on. Hey, I'm Brad Reynolds. Uh, I've had some technology companies here in Cleveland. Um, Started in like 97, 98, built a couple. A couple were like Expedient and uh, Mongoose Metrics. I flushed a couple companies for a lot of money. Uh, that wasn't good. And uh, so basically, uh, I've done some decent things and some really bad things. And uh, actually, the funny thing is, is an exit thing. So I just merged my current company with another company last week. So I'm back to working for the man again. <laughs> It's just fun. <laughs> I've uh, had almost everything except an IPO, I guess. I've had successful, successful exits, bad exits, good exits, uh, failed exits, canceled exits, uh, pretty much everything you could ask. So when, on Friday, you were talking about you know exits. I, they, they come in every possible shape and size. My favorite one, though, was one of the early ones I had. Where I got a small pile of cash and a really big pile of options from a publicly traded company. In less than 12 months, three of the four senior executives were indicted and two of them went to prison. Needless <laughs> to say, that really big pile of options is paper in our house. <laughs> Great. So, Laura, we'll, we'll start with you. So, regardless of the slides I put up and, and what I mentioned, 
what do you think is important that angel investors know about companies and exits? Uh, so, so from a CEO's perspective, I mean, obviously there has to be an exit. There has to be a plan for an exit and a drive to an exit because, you know, as I was always you know, spent a lot of time thinking about who is going to buy Embrace. This is a non-typical you know, play out there, a pet health insurance company, we're managing general agency, so not an insurance company, but a, a, a over-the-top uh, agency. And uh, how, how do people value this? Who's so likely to, to, to acquire us? And, um, and so, you know, we had to be really, really careful that we, A, were maximizing the value and also educating. So our t obvious target was going to be, or acquire was going to be uh, an insurance company. Insurance would buy us out. And in fact, our insurance partner um, did, they liked us so much, they offered to buy us. But unfortunately, you know, we, we went back and forth on the terms and we were very excited. Uh, and then we realized that despite the fact that we'd grown, I think at that point, 50% uh, a year and had you know, consistent growth and, and, uh, and we knew what we were doing, they refused to believe that we could possibly grow that way because in insurance, if you grow that fast, that means you've underpriced. So they were just absolutely sure we'd priced incorrectly and that they would have to fix this. Um, and uh, so, so we couldn't agree on the, on the price. And so then they said, well, uh, you know, right, so we'll have to agree to disagree. And they said, well, then go find another underwriter because they were our insurance partner. And uh, which of course puts us in a little uh, of, a, of a problem. So. Um, uh, I did. Uh, I did say that uh, you know, you, you uh, when someone proposes marriage to them, you don't you know, and you say no, you don't sleep together until you find something else. You you have to go somewhere else, and that was their view that we were not going to be partners ever. So, uh, so, so you have to be so careful about where your potentials are that uh, you know you, you have to be very aware and be tracking all the time about what you're doing to either educate them on your value or um, or grow to where you where they see the value being. Um, so. Great, and, and Brad, having gone through a couple of these, what kind of support does a CEO typically need, either from their angels, their VC, professional service providers? Presumably, you don't want to be uh, isolated. What kind of help does an entrepreneur need? Yeah, so the exit process seems like it's a legal process, but it's more of just, it's your biggest sales job. And uh, so it's emotional uh, and it messes up a lot. So if you can get some cooler heads around you, so service provider is a good law firm that's done so many deals and said, you can chill out on this or this is really important. If you don't have any context, hey, the law firm helps that out or a good board, basically people that have gone through it enough to say, hey, this is really important, you should push this or don't worry, chill out, let's negotiate this way. Um, I think that's probably the best thing. So you don't have to just be alone while you're trying to do it. Great. And Charlie, who gets to decide how to respond to an exit? So presumably an LOI comes in, interest is expressed, there's a CEO, a management team, a board, investors. How does that process work? Well, I mean, my overall thought is there's not a really good formula here because every single one I've been in has been different. So I don't have any wisdom to impart. I just have a lot of really good stories. <laughs> so my, my first exit, it was just me. So somebody offered to write me a big check, and I said yes. I didn't consult with anyone. I just took the check and cashed it and went home. Um, and then watched my options evaporate. But anyway, <laughs> maybe I should have talked to somebody. Um, the, the second big exit was to a, a, also to a, a fortune. 500 company and it was a lot different. They sent in you know, 28 people to interview our 24 people. Um, that was a little daunting. But we, we actually, we did a lot of, uh, there's a great movie called Beau Geste, where it's a castle or a, a fort in the middle of the, the desert and all the guys are dead, but they put the dead guys up to fool the natives and the thinking they're still full. So we actually had a lot of empty pods because we laid people off. So we put pictures, mostly of my family, and all the empty pods and then what were mostly dead computers um, at all the empty pods. 
and then you know coffee cups and stuff. So it looked like we were about five times bigger than we were, and, and frankly that worked. So and there's just a lot of window dressing and a lot of stuff you can do. And I, you know, I, I, I appreciate what Laura said about you're always planning for an exit, but in, in some cases you're not. You're focused on the company. It comes out of the blue. I mean, one of the best decisions we made was to turn down a twenty million dollar offer from uh, Warburg Pincus, no less. So a big private equity firm that we think would be successful. We thought we had more, so we just turned it down. So that, that's a whole other train of thought. Um, I wish I had wisdom, and I really don't. Just funny stories. So Laura, for you, you mentioned thinking about the exit early. Is it something that was typically on the table during senior management discussions? Is this something your board pushed you on? How often were you talking about a potential exit versus sales, marketing, growth, product? Um, well, we, we talked about, well, you know, it's 24 hours a day. So you talk about many things. And uh, so exit, we would talk about it along the way. Um, so, so I had a co-founder, Alex, and uh, we'd often meet Friday mornings at Starbucks in Chagrin Falls. It's actually a recommended for anyone, just get out of the office and then sort of reconnect, even if you're just not shooting the shit, really. That's, that's, we have no agenda. We just talk about all the things and keep each other connected. And, uh, and so part of that would be you know, exits. And, um, but, but Alex and I tended to think longer term than our investors, which obviously caused, caused some, some issues because they, they wanted shorter term. Um, but but we felt that, that it would actually get the highest value if we were to look out for a pretend exit time and then doing things to, to, get, to, that, to get to that point. So we, we talked about it. Uh, we talked about it with our investors. They obviously wanted an exit uh, at some point. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was not, not, it didn't take up much of us, our time, but for Alex and I, it was always at the back of our heads as to what, how we would get to that that exit? Not necessarily do we want it to be tomorrow. That wasn't wasn't really the case. So Brad, maybe pull back the curtain on on one of your exits here. So you you're approached. Are they throwing a number at you? Are they saying give us your best number? Are you doing this over drinks? Or are there corporate counsel and biz dev and lawyers involved? Uh, how does it work? So. Uh, I've always been the approacher. <laughs> Nobody's ever come to me to write me a check. Uh, I've kind of stoked the fires with competitors or strategic partners with the underlying intent that I would like them to buy us. So yeah, it came about, but the um, it was not unexpected, particularly. So as those things would come about, you know, I already kind of had to pre-plan, but if somebody came to me randomly off the street, and I wasn't planning on selling the company or didn't have any uh, understanding to do that, my first concern would be like, well, what does it mean for me? Like, you know, is this a retirement thing or am I going to have a job? And my next concern would be like, okay, this is a company to your, your point about not having, um, Laura's point about not having achieved the value you think you can drive out of the company. Do you want to leave it there and take the cash off the table now? That would be a concern. And then I haven't uh, had many investors in my companies. So I only had to consult with a couple of people. Really easy to have that. But if you have angels and board of directors, it's like, okay, once you figure out what it means for you, maybe the employees, it's like, okay, now it's time to go chat with those folks and be like, okay, is this the right thing? Because I have a legal, ethical, moral, whatever. So a responsibility to other people. It's not just, is it good for me or not good for me? And even if you're the only one that owns the company, it's still a responsibility to employees and the folks that actually built it while you just sat up there and were the king or queen of the, of the entity. So it, um, yeah, I think um, it's a existential crisis if somebody comes and says they want to buy your company. It's like, what goes on there? So, um, yeah, that's it. So I think that tees it up for, for Charlie. As you're thinking about whether or not to take an exit, whether or not you're even on the right track of, of having the right level of, uh, of, uh, of cash, of stock for a deal, 
how do you go about that process? Meaning, you don't necessarily have time for a fairness opinion. You might not have an investment banker engaged. Some companies that are in software as a service go for four times revenue. Some go for 12 times. Right? How, how do you go about thinking about it in a way that is fair, appropriate, maximizing value for everyone, decreases the chance you'll get sued by investors, all those good things? So I, I take back my earlier comment. I do have one piece of wisdom, which is whether you're trying to get acquired or somebody comes and is, expresses an interest in, being, in acquiring you, I think the number one thing you need to do is try to think like they're thinking. I mean, there, there's no more important skill set than empathy, whether you're playing poker, trying to get some person at a bar to go out with you, or trying to get a company to make you a big offer. Understanding their position and where they're coming from is the single most important thing. And an awareness of externalities is also important. So in, in the one instance, I actually spent 18 months knowing we were going to get acquired by somebody because the industry we were in was going to consolidate. And I spent a lot of time at conferences and working with Gartner, the big analyst group, to position our company as a leader in a particular space with the sole idea of when a company called Gartner and said, who should we buy, they would say, buy Flashline. And darned if that didn't exactly happen like that. So BEA went to Gartner and said, who should we buy? And they said, buy Flashline. And then on the, on the price point, you know, we've never set a price. I mean, you want to, we've always been lucky enough to have the acquirer come to us. So you can always say, well, you know, we're, we're, we're doing fine. You want to offer us money, you know, go ahead and we'll get back to you. And that's obviously the better position to be in if you can do it. Great. So Laura, having gone through the process, uh, we need advice. As seed investors, we're investing at a point where maybe there are five to eight people in a company, the angel level, there's probably some revenue, but not much. There's a product that works well enough at least to put it in front of customers. But what skills, attributes should we look at uh, in your experience that could give us some measure of confidence that, yeah, this CEO has what it takes to get a company to the point of exit and then to navigate an exit? Is there a set of soft skills or hard skills you see that we should look for? Uh, it's, that's, uh, you know, there's, basically you need to have confidence that they are really looking ahead. I mean, they're not just executing today and, and you know, maximizing their capabilities. You know, it's got KPIs and they're obsessed with the day to day, but they're able to step back and uh, and and look look outside. I mean, I think what Charlie said was exactly right. The externalities. What else is going on in the industry? And maybe there are some things going on that you need to be out there sooner than later. Well, you need a CEO that's not just got the head down and executing, but is actually able to step to heads up. And that's really hard when you're really small. So trying to balance that, uh, that, that uh, is, is, is a rare skill, I suppose, or it's exactly the kind of people that you're looking for in, in the CEOs, but that's where I, would, where I would look. Great. So I have one last question, then we'll take questions from the audience. So Brad, when we were talking last week, you said, just build a company with great metrics and the rest will take care of itself. So tell us more. It's not the full story, I guess, because you already poo-pooed it earlier. But uh, it's, uh, you know, you start a company, certainly if you want to raise angel money, that company is for sale from day one, because you shouldn't raise money from other people if you're going to just make it your lifestyle business. So everything I've built is for sale from day one. There's just certain things you have to construct along the way. So yeah, you want a profitable, fast-growing, top-line business, great gross margins, throwing up tons of cash. Like all those things happen over time when you delight your customers and they love the thing that you do and you're solving an order of magnitude problem that nobody else can solve really well. So you, you want to build those metrics because there might not be a future round of investors, there might not be an acquirer, um, but you're always constructed and like on that same phone call, uh, Charlie is going to be up later, 
different Charlie. This Charlie's good too. But uh, uh, you know, he was saying like we always had a data room, and you know, so at any point somebody could come in and kind of we're prepped. And so like having that strategy, uh, or like at companies that I've had, we would always partner with people who would be potential acquirers, so we'd integrate to their systems. So like, okay, we integrated like 50 different systems, that would raise our profile with Adobe and Salesforce and all these other companies that would be potential acquirers um, from the start, and it was done intentionally to sell ourselves. Um, and But it also benefited the client. So yeah, I think there's both sides. Like, you know, what you can rely on is I'm making profit, I can continue to pay my employees, I don't need to raise another round of financing. It's a safe spot. Um, but on the other side, if I'm not constructed to sell tomorrow, um, I'm kind of screwed up. Like, I really need to be constructed to sell. You know, hey, somebody wants to do a deal in 10 days, here you go, ready to go. Uh, and that's happened multiple times to people in this room. So, um, you can have both. I think you can have to have both those things. Great. Questions from the audience? Amy? I've got one for Laura. Uh, I really enjoyed your story about how um, your insurer offered to acquire you and you were in a place spot. Um, and, you know, I'm wondering, I don't know how that turned out, but I'm wondering if in retrospect there were things that you could have done to uh, protect yourself, you know, from being put into that situation. Good question. So the question was, you know, in the situation where our underwriter ended up ditching us because the uh, the deal didn't go through, what could, could we have done something? Could we protect ourselves against that? And in actual fact, and this wasn't due to my brilliance, but uh, I, I could try and take credit for it. But uh, we uh, we had actually uh, found a second underwriter. Uh, they well, they found us. They wanted us to um, provide product for a distribution channel that we wouldn't otherwise have had access to. So I felt it wasn't a conflict. And there was nothing in our agreement with our other underwriter that said we couldn't do this. And uh, and so we partnered with them. And then the other first underwriter went, wait a minute, this is not normally what happens. Normally we're the ones with all the power, um, which I think then worried them and then prompted them to, into this. So in some ways, you know, yes, we might have prompted this, but also we had a, a backup that we could move to over time. But I think you do have to worry about those kind of circumstances and, and absolutely you need to protect yourself as best you can. Um, so otherwise you're in someone else's pocket and your leverage is so, so low. So you've got to, be, uh, got to be very highly aware of that particular circumstance. And we were lucky enough to, to, to have, uh, you know, we weren't forced into having people accept a deal that would have not been good. Any other questions? Mike? Yeah, Brad, you mentioned that you were proactive in trying to maneuver some, uh, cultivate some potential acquisitions. In doing that, were you trying to strategically get a couple of them at the same time or close to one at a time? Were we trying to get a competitive uh, situation? This would be a cheap investment banker. Yeah. Um, it didn't, it only worked out actually in the security last company where there were two uh, competitors who had both raised a lot of private equity, 60, 70 million. And they both wanted our IP. Um, I tried to do it that way the whole on all of them, but it never worked out except for the last one. And we've always been so small, it wasn't, you know, there wasn't really an investment banking process. Um, but yeah, I mean, that would be the ideal. I just, it's only happened once and it wasn't for a sig really significant amount of money. So uh, I think I would rather leave that fighting, stoking to the professionals who take their 5% or whatever it is. Uh, they're the people that make the real money now. <laughs> Time for one more question, if there's one more out there. Eric? How did your companies do after they were acquired? You hear a lot of companies get acquired and go. Uh, uh, so the first company ended up being part of Barnes & Noble after a long, somewhat torturous legal path. So they ended up okay. Uh, the second company, the Flashline company, was really a surprise because when the acquirer, BEA, which was a big, soon-to-be Oracle, 
big company uh, in the technology space came in. They were shocked at the quality of our software developers. So they actually grew the team significantly and gave us five other teams around the world to manage. So that was that was pretty cool. So we really they, they really appreciated the retention and the quality of the teams here in Cleveland that we had built. So there are still six or seven people from an exit that happened ten years ago that are still working for Oracle and still on the same product. In fact, Oracle bought BEA for seven billion dollars. And the only two products that are left are ours and one other one. So huge, and, and everyone who works there and work. In fact, to, to tie all the strings together, most of the management team except me now run on shift. So that it is by all definitions a world class management team. Terrific. Well, please join me in thanking panel number one, and we will invite up panel number two. Panel number two has set an impressive standard by sitting in the appropriate seats under their <laughs> pictures, so we thank you for that coordination. Uh, Charlie, maybe you could start us out with a brief intro. Hi, everybody. I know many of you. I'm Charlie Lowheed. I've uh, done uh, three startups in Cleveland, two uh, we sold at public firms. The most recent one was Explorus. Uh, we uh, sold that to IBM in 2015. It became so Explorus was big data uh, in healthcare, and we uh, it became IBM Watson Health's big data backbone. Grew to the company to about uh, it's high probably around 300 employees. Built a building here in Cleveland. Uh, uh, excited to see IBM do that, and uh, now I'm doing investing, and as well as uh, I'm a I'm a partner with. Uh, with uh, a, a group of individuals, Steve McHale and Dick Baker and others, uh, called Unify Project, which is rewiring the economy. So it's a nonprofit, so using big data, it's a lot of fun. Charu Ramanathan, uh, co founder of Cardio Insight, uh, was acquired by Medtronic in 2015. Um, worked for Medtronic for two years and took an exit from Medtronic and started. Uh, two companies uh, in two spaces that are very different from the medical device space that I co-founded Cardio Insight. One is a, in a social network for patients and the other called Vital Exchange and the other one is a microfinance credit scoring company for uh, alleviating global, uh, global poverty called Lokyatra, which means in Sanskrit for the attainment of a better world. So completely different space. Um, maybe you're a little allergic to uh, organization that's in charge of public safety called the FDA but uh, but the cardio insight uh, experience really you know uh, introduced me to entrepreneurship and I understood what the word exit meant and hopefully we'll get into a little bit of detail about that as well I'm Steve Potash I'm the founder and CEO of a local company I created 30 years ago called overdrive we had two exits, private equity, and more recently to a public Japanese conglomerate. I'm still operating the company here in Cleveland, Ohio, where we have a world headquarters with about 400 employees. And we are serving 42,000 public libraries, schools, universities, academic institutions in 75 countries. Terrific. So, Charlie, we'll start with you. So, Explorers was not your first rodeo. How did your previous ventures prepare you to create exit value kind of day one? Yeah, Todd, you know, I think uh, from the very beginning, we thought about shareholder value, and it's something we talked about with everybody in the company. Now, everybody at Explorers had uh, stock options, and that was something that Steve and I thought was really important, that people felt like they had some ownership in the company. 
And, uh, and then if you think about it, companies that provide really good customer service and customer products and value usually generate shareholder value. And so, you know, that was one thing that was really important. We also thought about shareholder value in terms of big, right? Um, we wanted to do something that really mattered in the world, and that was essentially bring empirical data at scale to healthcare. It was something that was missing in the pharmaceutical space. It was costing billions on R&D uh, within research and other types of trials. It was a big, would be a big issue in value-based care and, and reform of healthcare. So we knew that it was really important. And we knew that doing that would create shareholder value. Uh, and we, we even looked at comps. So we said, you know, what are other organizations like Optum or, uh, or even outside of healthcare, what were they doing in terms of, or setting in terms of valuations on data? Because data was becoming this new, they were calling it the new oil. Uh, and, and we kind of came to the conclusion, well, it's really about collecting lives of data. Right, and that's what would drive value. So a lot of what we did, we said, well, if we can provide value and we can do something that's really meaningful and provide statistical re relevance that doesn't exist today and change healthcare, we'll drive shareholder value. And those are the equations we ran. So at one point, one of our one of our first slides and our when we raised our A round was it was really simple. It just said we will amass 50 million lives in data. It will produce around 50 million dollars in annual revenue over time. And that in of itself will produce around $500 million in shareholder value. And uh, that was a really bold statement, but it's something that, you know, we didn't consume ourselves with, but we all got it. That that's what really matters. And without shareholder value, it's pretty hard to do really cool, big, exciting, and impacting things. And so that was, that was the strategy. Okay. So, Charter, do I share your allergy of the FDA? <laughs> It, it is difficult to uh, grow and bet on a company when, in addition to the many challenges you have internally of building a product, that there's a third party that has so much control. But that said, as you built the company, took it through exit, uh, very different than uh, companies not governed by the FDA because you couldn't sell your product to anyone, you couldn't drive any revenue. How did that process work with the acquirer in terms of kind of communicating value to them and making sure they understood and appreciated what you had? Um, so for healthcare businesses, this is something that um, the FDA is uh, a friendly enemy. You have to acknowledge that. And that's something, you know, from a very scientific PhD background, I just wanted to take the technology from bench to bedside to the patient uh, and make money from it. But it didn't really, it wasn't really apparent what the role of a regulatory body was and how important it was to convert the, the, the concepts that we had, the engineering prototypes that we had into something that was reliable, repeatable, safe, effective. We set those words, but what does that mean to the FDA that's, that is seeing hundreds of thousands of devices a day? And how do we, how do we say that in words that shows that you're a first time company, so you don't have a track record of millions of devices that you produce that's safe and effective. You're the, this is the first time. You're building a reputation with an organization that's the gatekeeper that allows you to put it on patients. And um, for us, we develop from a quality perspective, we develop the device internally with, with high reliability and quality, and we could stand you know, I, I, I use the devices myself. I did a lot of these studies on the patient. So why wouldn't, how, what convinces the FDA that, that we needed to do this? Um, lots of documentation, lots of testing. And, um, you know, one of the things, and if anybody has worked with engineers, whether they're software engineers or any engineers, they don't like documentation. Um, everybody wants to write code and everybody wants to see things work. And as you know, as a first-time entrepreneur, the excitement was seeing in something work, not writing about it, mm -hmm. but with respect to exit. And so from a valuation perspective, so how the Cardio Insight deal was structured was we had an exit valuation, which was roughly about $100 million, and then we had three years' worth of earnouts. And the clock started ticking one year after we received the FDA approval, which actually triggered acquisition. So let's say we got FDA approval in 2015. 
we had 2016 would be the first year of earnouts, for example. So that, um, that would only happen if a company like Medtronic was comfortable in taking the FDA, their FDA, not Cardio Insights FDA, which is a little startup FDA, very friendly, everything's, you know, you're a startup company, right? We know you. Uh, versus uh, Medtronic that will get dinged if, uh, if, if, if the Cardio Insight product fails and they, they have to take multiple products off the shelf because if, they, if the FDA suspects a systemic issue, then there's a problem. So the bar that we had to cross to get the product out on the market was extremely high. So from an exit perspective, the lesson learned is to get prepared, which means that the quality standards and the level of documentation you need for a medical device company, especially from an earn out company, the dollars that you receive from the device entering the market and you're making money from it, has to be taken into account. Or else you're gonna kind of take the hit on the other side because large healthcare companies are very conservative when it comes to the FDA and uh, getting devices out under their label. So this is a very, very big lesson learned. Of course, I was a coward. I ran the other way and started something else that's totally in <laughs> the space. But that's a lesson. Great, thank you. So Steve, will you tell us a little bit about your most recent exit, you know, transitioning to a point where you know, I've been out to your shop Big, beautiful building, obviously a lot of culture. You can tell just by walking in the door, hundreds of employees, but now you've sold to a international publicly traded company. What is that like? Um, now when I grew up aspiring to be part of a Japanese public company, but what happened was uh, in 2011, I took some, some chips off the table with private equity in New York. We were growing profitably and no debt. And we were in an enviable position, but I knew to get to the next level, especially growth globally, we wanted to get some smart money. Staff, I'll trade with you. Okay. But after uh, three and a half years with wonderful top shelf private equity partners, Insight Venture Partners in New York, great guys, very smart. I kind of hand selected them for that round. After three plus years of continued growth, it, you know, they were trying to manage my business more for the liquidity event versus me for long-term success for my partners in our industry. So it was kind of time for them to go. So I uh, helped with their, with their blessing. We, we said it's time for a strategic partner, someone who would enable us to get the exit and allow me to continue to build this company with a 10-year you know, roadmap. And really, not try and operate it for just dressing up a book in a road show. So uh, we went through a process. I uh, hired one of the top shelf firms out of San Francisco, Catalyst Partners, who've done billion dollar deals. And um, when you are operating profitably in a growth market, you have all the best options, which we had. And so we were fortunate, we went through a process, which I kind of you know, orchestrated, and the Japanese public company came in almost 20% above every other bid, and even though this was my first choice after meeting with their senior leadership management, uh, we said, okay, that could work. So here we are. So the company's called Rakuten. Now you're gonna see that name more in the US. Rakuten in Japanese means optimism. They are the NBA sponsor for the Golden State Warriors. So you're gonna see Rakuten and Steph Curry and those guys. Didn't help me so much last year in Cleveland, but when I'm in California, I go, 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 go Warriors. When I'm in California, I got a lot of California customers. We use it there. They also sponsor FC Barcelona globally. So it's, it is basically the Amazon of Japan, a, a dominant global e-commerce technology company. And we get to pick and choose uh, using some of the assets and reach that they have. And of course, like I said, um, uh, they came in and a tremendous offer that made it kind of hard to uh, look away. So speaking of hard to look away, IBM, uh, what, 50, 70,000 employees, publicly traded a billion dollar, many, many billion dollar company. What was it like to have them descend on you and conduct diligence to essentially be the cornerstone of Watson Health? Well, yeah. I, First, it's it's a little surreal, right? Uh, you get you get so our our due diligence period from the point of which they said 
because we had we had um, we had been looking at some other investments prior to that. We uh, we we actually decided that we would prepare to go public, uh, probably do some kind of private equity round in between that, because we had to grow. And unfortunately, it was really hard to grow in Cleveland. Uh, it's hard to find talent. When you get to about 150 people, you gotta you kind of need to expand other cities, and that required a lot of money. So that kind of got their attention, which you know we were we were uh, you know pleased and, and flattered, you know. Uh, but when it, it came down to the opportunity, and they said, "All right, we're, we'd like to we'd like to put a term sheet in front of you," uh, and we accepted. Within nine days, we were closed. It was one of IBM's fastest uh, closings ever, and they had a deadline. They wanted to be announced announced during this national event, this national show. So it, you know, luckily, we had that to our benefit. The other thing I think we had to our benefit, I think, was uh, the fact that we had this philosophy, ha having done startups and exits before, of uh, having a data room always ready. It was one of those things that, uh, you know, it really forces you into thinking. I mean, when you put it together in a data room, it's a little bit humbling once in a while, especially if you haven't been on top of it. You're like, oh my God, I've been putting all this work and effort into this thing, and, and we've got all these gaps. It's good to get those things out ahead of time. It's also good to take uh, for for the team to take take an accounting of the awesome things that they've done. Whether that's IP that goes into the data room, so why not celebrate? Why not talk about it, right? The financials every month you're doing them, so put them in the data room. Uh, even if you're not out looking for money, same thing. The same thing for uh, IP and products. These are the these are the these are the solutions we're using, uh, and this is this is why we're authorized to use them. Uh, whether it's open source or whatever it might be. These are things that really slow a deal down, but get you to be a good company thinking about from a stewardship standpoint, how you're gonna shepherd this thing through during a somewhat emotional and, and scary time. So uh, anyways, IBM decides to fly in. They got like multiple private jets. Uh, they take an entire floor at the Intercontinental. Uh, it was like a two to one, right? Uh, there are two of them to one of us. Uh, of course, we sat him down with that first slide, and after a good laugh, uh, you know, uh, we, the one I was talking about valuations, they, uh, we agreed that, that this is where we think the numbers will be, and we were ha really happy with it. And at that point, it was really about understanding, is this a company we think can take the business to the next level, to really maximize our shareholders' value? And do we think we can maximize theirs? Can they fill our gaps? Right? And we had many of them. And it was okay to talk. And one thing I really liked about IBM is we talked about all the reasons why uh, we were still immature and the things that were missing our business. And they said, we can help you fix that. And they actually got energized about it. It got to the point where they were beginning to sell us on them, right? And why this would be so important for us. So, you know, on top of the trust factor, and we just liked each other, uh, you know, I think that we got to a point where. Uh, it made sense to move forward, and, and a few days later, we had we had an announcement. But it was uh, it was scary. But I tell you, they, they they treated us really well. So, Charu, on your cap table, you had individual angels, jumpstart, multiple venture capital groups, and then you brought in money from the strategic that eventually bought you. How did you balance those interests, and how tricky was that to make sure that? All those different constituents were just reasonably happy, but were ready to sign documents when the time came. So, um, from a founder perspective, um, I never saw them as their liquidation preferences or their um, how do I say the the series that they came in. Um, so, at every stage, the business had risk, and of course, earlier stage investors take on more. But as we grew the business, like every stage had a different risk, right? So for me, as a founder, I, I had really strong relationships with all my shareholders, especially those early investors, particularly Jumpstart. And this one angel that actually um, was one of the largest investors in Cardio Insight. So, um, and so from an exit perspective, to be honest, I, you know, from an academic background, to me, an exit strategy was the last slide in your deck that you had to put to, to get investment. I didn't know anything beyond that, to be honest. So I said, exit strategy. A big medical device company will acquire us <laughs> uh, somehow, because medical device companies acquire other companies because they don't innovate, right? That was the logic, and people 
who bought it? <laughs> but five years into operating the business, um, you know, obviously I had a learning curve. I learned on the job, I'll be honest. Um, and then it, it became uh, time for us to start thinking in terms of value. I mean, a lot of the things that you said, Charlie, is like, yeah, that's how I feel now, but that's not how I felt as I was going through my first journey. So um, I think from that perspective, it was like a pregnancy. It's time to push, was how the exit was. And at that time was how do I optimize shareholder value and make sure that the investments strategy, which was our series C round, which was basically a two, between 20 and $30 million round for us to enter the, the US market uh, and the Europe European market, basically scale up. So we were in very early, we were in clinical trial stages. We, we had shown proof of concept and the next was, you know, getting the FDA approval and then basically selling systems. So scaling up on that sales and marketing round. So we could raise um, capital, VC uh, capital for 20, 30 million dollars, or we could go to a strategic and then really position ourselves for an exit. So from my perspective and myself as a shareholder, uh, that the strategic avenue made more sense um, because it was time to start dating. Uh, and that's what we did. Because the valuations that came in, particularly also the economy that wasn't all that suitable for great valuations for the stage we were in as a medical device company. So the strategic, uh, so Medtronic actually put in close to $30 million for us to acquire a couple milestones. Um, I was very frugal about that, so I spent about half of that and the rest went into shareholder return. But again, going back to your question, it was at that point it was a game about doing the right thing for the shareholders because we, we, were, we were ready to, to get this baby out. So great. So Steve, you mentioned that uh, Rakuten was willing to pay twenty percent more than your next. Let's not let's not publish that for them who they're done. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you yeah. mentioned that you created a great uh, shareholder value for your. What were they so excited about? Was it the technology, the customers you brought, uh, the vision of a global enterprise base in the U.S.? Kind of what? What was the acquirer value that they were buying from you? Well, we had uh, a very enviable business, which was um, a company that had reoccurring revenue, long-term contracts with ninety-nine percent renewal rates, with institutions and no debt. So we had every positive metric an investor would want. It was just a matter of who, and I still was the largest shareholder, who I felt, we're a mission-driven company. We're a certified B Corp, and we work on the benefit of public libraries, school districts to help educate and spread literacy and adopted their mission. And we felt it was very important to have a partner that appreciated that. Fortunately, our, our acquirer is that company. So they saw the value system that we had built and the fact that I had 20 years of reoccurring double-digit growth with earnings and no debt, double-digit growth of EBITDA. So, you know, they were willing to pay a premium for a company that had every great attribute. And we're in a market that has uh, unlimited upside and international growth. So, you know, just like many of us, I'm a private investor in a lot of deals, and I sometimes only want to look at the best deal. Show me the best deal you have. We felt we were that premium deal, and uh, we have a partner that appreciated that value. So, terrific. So one more question, then we'll put it out to the audience here. Charlie, we mentioned earlier that most dialogues about exit don't come to fruition. They either stop at the discussion phase, the letter of interest phase, the term sheet phase. As a CEO, or for us as investors, how can we help our companies get to no faster in the situations where it's going to be a no, so it's not distracting, so it doesn't burn cycles, so it doesn't hurt company culture? How do you get to no? Well, you know, one thing is, is, is try the trick the other way around. You know how they're, they're evaluating you on your, on your numbers? And, uh, you know, to, Steve, to Steve's point about how uh, you, know, you want to talk about what you're doing and, and your metrics are important, well, their metrics are important as well. I mean, one basic one is one of the, we had this one organization that was really interested in us. 
And and remember, we had gone out to dinner with them. They had come to town, spent all this time with them. And then afterwards, I'm like, well, how much money do they have on their balance sheet? And it was like for like a, you know like 20 percent of what we were willing to ever sell the company for. And I'm like, okay, well, they don't have got the cash or the stock to buy us. So what the heck are we doing? And that was one of those I can't believe we just did that moments. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think beyond that, if they have the wherewithal, probably the most important thing to do is get to really understand very quickly. Is there a culture fit? Because I tell you, once you get past the exit and the, and the, the euphoria wears off a few months later, you do begin to ask yourself, hey, was that the right thing to do for the employees? Was that the right thing to do for our customers? And you've got to ask that question really early on. And, 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 and think about those questions ahead of time, what the right answer would be for the possible acquirer. And if they don't nail them, just move on. Unless you absolutely have to sell your business, which hopefully you don't, hang on there. Uh, you know, evaluate that because that is something, it's one thing to sell a business, it's another thing to see it continue to flourish. And you know, like, like Charlie was saying, you know, that that's important for your next thing. And uh, and you gotta be able to ask yourself that and, and, you know, when you look at a, at a possible suitor. Great. Questions from the group? Chuck? Charlie, um, two questions. One is uh, what you described, whether you relate on IBM and uh, how you uh, got together, beautiful culture, what has happened recently? And secondly, you talked about unity. I don't know if you can tell us anything about that. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, first off, you know, we didn't have any illusions. IBM is a big company, uh, they're, they've been around for over 100 years. They have a lot of moving parts. Uh, they acquired five companies to make Watson Health at the time. And uh, we were one of them. And uh, that's a very tough job. And, and you know, there are growing pains to that. Uh, there are, uh, you know, they've got the market shifting around them. And, uh, in, 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 but if you look at the balance of things, I'm pretty proud of what the team has done here in Cleveland and continues to do. And, uh, and I know they're committed, right? Uh, so, you know, I think, I, I, you know, you always look at these things and say, you know, should, like for instance, I stayed two years, I'm like, should, I, should I stay any longer? I kind of I felt like a fifth, six year senior at some point. I'm like, I gotta get out of here. Like Will Ferrell went back to school. <laughs> Time to leave. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I, so I'm proud of what they're doing. And I, I think just like a lot of large corporations, uh, they're struggling. It's hard to be a public company uh, so, you know, uh, hats off to them. Uh, Unify Project is a really fun thing. You know, one of the things that we looked at uh, in this whole process, I mentioned how hard it was to hire people in Cleveland. That's a really big problem. We have got to fix that for our local economy because if we don't, you won't see big startups. You won't see big growth. We can only bring so many people from out, in from outside the region. We have got tens of thousands of extremely talented individuals in our city core that aren't getting the kind of education that's going to prepare them for jobs of the 21st century. And that has a that has a catastrophic and will continue to have a catastrophic impact on our GDP locally over time. Um, and we need to fix that. If you just look at since about 1980, productivity has continued to go up like this, yet, yet uh, take home pay is pretty much beginning to kind of plateau out. So they are separating from each other. That bifurcation of wealth and bifurcation of income and productivity is going to continue to be a problem, and we need to rethink about how, how we've got the how this economy works. And so part of Unify is to take big data, system uh, analytics and system dynamics and system modeling and AI and look at all this massive amount of data and see what's actually working and what's not. And uh, and so I'm just glad to be part of it. It's a lot of fun. Time for one more question. Okay, well, we'll transition here to panel number three. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right.
So thank you to each of you for being here. This is the group of people who each hopefully didn't break too many laws getting over here tonight, but had a earlier event and were kind enough to say they could join us and participate if they were on the very last panel of the day. So we thank you all for uh, being here. Let's introduce yourselves for a moment and then we'll jump right into the questions. Good evening, I'm Sam Gervais. Good evening, I'm Sam Gervais. Um, I've had the good fortune to start, grow, and sell, or take public for software companies over the last 33 years. The one you may know about is Flash Sheets, a, a sports and live entertainment ticketing company. So if you've attended an event at the queue recently, you've probably used Flash Sheets. And I started company number five last year. It's in uh, North Coast Angel Fund 3. It's Convey. Uh, Morris Wheeler. Many of you know me as the manager of Drummond Road Capital, which out of our 60-plus companies, we've had anywhere from eight to 10 exits, depending on how you define exit, um, ranging from sideward uh, things to really good returns. Um, what many of you may not know is that uh, I exited my internet company in uh, 2000. Uh, we sold to a very large uh, entertainment company. And I exited my public industrial company, which had nothing to do with software, um, not once, but twice. Um, in 2008 and again last January. Um, and uh, I guess that was that. I guess Todd just needed to fill in the panel because, gosh, I'm really humbled to be on the stage with these guys, all these exits. My name is Susan Williamson. Um, I led um, a sale of a local company called C-Track to a company out of California called Peary Software at the beginning of 2016. Um, C-Track was a 44-year-old database firm that had transitioned into digital marketing, was one of the top partners of Salesforce Marketing Cloud, as was Peary. Um, Peary had offices in California, Colorado, and um, they had a presence in Japan, which was very interesting to Salesforce. Um, so their acquisition of us triggered a seed investment from Salesforce in our combined organization and also um, an investment from MDC, which is a uh, global advertising agency holding firm. Susan, we'll stay, stay with you. So there are obviously some similarities with uh, Puri the Acquirer uh, and your company, C-Track, being both Salesforce partners, but there are hundreds of partners in, under the various Salesforce clouds. What do you think it was about C-Track that they were interested in, the value you created that they wanted to uh, have it be part of their organization? That's an interesting question. So um, Perry took a typical um, Silicon Valley approach to their business with Salesforce, um, which first of all means they had a great um, great relationship with Salesforce. They were their neighbors. Um, they had personal relationships uh, with the leadership teams. So that was good. We didn't have that. But what we did have was um, a business that had really, um, had really worked hard to um, operationalize, build processes, procedures, contracts, recurring revenue, um, and we were recognized for um, our database expertise, which um, we had 40 years of experience handling marketing data. And so moving into that digital space, I think um, it provided a special value uh, for us. Great, so keep coming this way, Morris. So you invest in deals in Northeast Ohio, but also across the country. What do you wish that Midwest investors knew more or appreciated more about getting to an exit? They should never worry about it, and they should worry about building the best company they can possibly build and let the exit take care of itself. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's dig in a little bit more. So, earlier part of the conversation we had was the, the companies bought versus sold. Right. And I'm going to take a wild guess on what side of that you, you would be. Do you truly mean, though, that not to, not, not to worry about it? but that there shouldn't be regular actions and activities by a company to build specific relationships and take steps towards an exit. Truly, not a build it, they'll come, but build a great company and the rest takes care of itself. You need to build a great company. You need to build relationships over time. Um, but in terms of, well, so let me give an, let me give an example, okay? 
when I first became the CEO of Cohesant, it was a public company. And within six weeks of having taken control of Cohesant, one of our big competitors came and said that they wanted to buy us. And um, they came and they told us, you know, what their structure was and what they looked for and how they used multiples and how they looked at your cash flow. And when they were done, I gave them the number that I would accept to sell. And when they finished laughing, they left the room. Um, and for the next seven years, I would send them our press releases. I would send them the things that we accomplished. I would seek them out at trade shows and I would talk to them and I would um, find out what was going on. Not because I wanted to sell, because the company was never for sale in that way, but because I wanted to be able to learn more about their business because it was relevant to my business. I wanted to build a relationship with the big players in, in our area because someday there might have been partnerships or things we could do together and I thought it was best. And I also thought it was a pretty good idea to keep my eyes on the 800 pound gorilla in my area. Eight years after the initial conversation, they came back and they said, we want to buy your company. And I said, that's great. You saw how that went the first time. I'm, I'm hoping you're, you've changed the way you look at valuation a little bit. And they basically said, we have, we know, and yes, we want to buy your company and we're going to buy it this time. And I never once was positioning the company for sale. I was just creating relationships with the people that I thought that could help my business over time. And it just so happened that that, that also happened to uh, pique their interest and I guess over a period of time make them um, um, keep notice of us and know, but, but never was I thinking to myself, I'm going to sell to them someday. Great. So Sam, exits like anything else are impacted by environment, trends, business cycles. Do you have a crystal ball that you can help us understand <laughs> where are we today in general terms? If I had a crystal ball, <laughs> I wouldn't have started a software company. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's really true that the environment uh, in many cases dictates uh, the conditions of, of many exits. Um, the, the company, the conditions uh, for which companies now go public versus uh, you know, up, to the, up to the early 1990s, you had to have a five-year track record of profitability, you know, typically about $100 million in top-line revenue, um, and a variety of other important characteristics to take a company public, and then the internet happened, and that changed entirely, right? So the, the, the rating market conditions really determine a lot about exits, and what's going on right now is um, we're seeing uh, most investors, most investment dollars move later and later stages. Um, we're seeing uh, a lot of new money in the market, but it's going late. It's going into private equity. And um, so less and less investment, especially in, in the non-Silicon uh, non Valley communities, coming in early stage. Um, what it suggests is for the next three to five years, um, there's going to be a lot of private equity available for companies to consolidate what they do. And so the conditions are ripe for strategic exits less ripe for the old traditional cycle of take round one, two, three, before you're really viable and, and go. Um, so I'm with Morris. You, it, you, can't, you can't be planning for that exit. You don't know what the market conditions are going to be like. Um, constantly building shareholder value is important, but keeping your visibility up um, uh, in the market. And, and, and for anybody who's thinking about an exit in the next three to five years, um, I suspect valuations will be good by strategic acquirers because they have a lot of cheap capital available. Great. So, Susan, help us understand balancing the effort to sell the business without disrupting what's working in the first place. So you've got a relatively small company. Not everyone, I presume, knew that these discussions were underway or at least wasn't privy to the, the details. How did you navigate that to maximize the likelihood that something happened? but not put all your eggs in one basket either. Well, gosh, it was pretty tricky. So um, I think we were about 45 um, team members when we sold. And 
Um, I had three majority partners that owned the business that worked within the business um, for me. And we had three business units, so it was sort of a complex business for, um, for the size of business that it was. Um, one thing that I, I think um, I would have changed if I had to do it over was to involve sort of the VP level team earlier on. Um, obviously, the owners knew that we were talking. Um, the CFO knew because we needed um, her critical input. Um, and then there was this, this VP layer, and we just had super talented people. Um, and I, I don't think we were ready to let the cat out of the bag entirely. Um, I, I wish now that we would have gotten them all on a plane and gone out to California together um, and sort of had more, more feet on the street and more you know, eyes on the business. And I think um, we might have made a different decision at the end of the day. Um, so I guess we didn't involve as many people as we um, could have. I would have liked to involve more. There, there was a tricky dynamic as well, both being in the same partner ecosystem with Salesforce that we had to um, keep it a little bit on the down low. So Sam, something we've talked about on a couple of different panels is just that most exit conversations don't go anywhere or don't go where you want them to go. Uh, from an investor's perspective, have, you know, I know you've invested in a lot of early stage companies, mentored and been on boards. What do you see that tells you, hmm, this thing might actually happen, or guys, don't spend any more time and energy here, just go about your business? If IBM flies in multiple private jets <laughs> and outnumbers you two to one on a full floor in the Intercontinental, you can be reasonably sure they're interested. <laughs> <laughs> they're just had nothing else to do there. Um, I don't think there's a lot of rocket science to it, but couple things, you know, I think Charlie mentioned it uh, perhaps briefly, but uh, especially first time CEOs, and I suffered from this problem until was otherwise mentored, don't do due diligence on a potential acquirer. You feel like a subordination, a large company acquiring you means that you don't have the right or you don't have the need. Um, you know, so one thing is to do some due diligence on the acquirer, and not just on their financials, but frankly, talk to other companies they've acquired. Right. Um, and, uh, and and ask about what the process was like and, and how much momentum there was. And uh, it's surprising what information you can glean. Um, uh, th there's a reason to do that, um, and and there's a reason to assess momentum. Um, and that is, I've been in several industries where the the, the or a dominant player in the industry used pseudo interest in an acquisition to gain competitive intelligence. Right? So on a regular basis, they would make an, they would make an approach. Um, they would be the big company, you, you're a wonderful small company, they would, they would uh, try and get away with a, um, a very limited, say, non-disclosure agreement or one that didn't limit them from using certain information. And they, then they'd walk away and they did this on a regular basis. So you can gauge a company's interest if they're willing to sign an appropriate agreement right, that limits them from stealing your information. If they're willing to sign a short no shot, right? Uh, in other words, you know, they're gonna get the deal done in a short period of time or they're gonna walk away uh, and you can go to some other suitor. And, uh, and frankly, if they're gonna ask for a longer process, if they'll put some skin in the game. Uh, but maybe most important to me is the human side of things. Uh, uh, um, uh, without, without, on a board on which I sat, I think um, uh, it was the perception that we were close to the 11th hour for an acquisition and the other party walked away. And in retrospect, as we looked at it, um, the communications had been remote, right? Electronic, phone calls, everything else. I find immense um, value in the signals of one-on-one -on -one meetings or group-on-one -on -one meetings where you're going to their facility and you start to talk in the halls to people who aren't directly involved with the deal. Do they know about it? Are they invested in it? Is the other group increasing their momentum? Are the number of people in the room increasing? Um, and are you seeing their energy? If you're not seeing that, that organization isn't really committed to the process. And I think it's really important to assess all that because if 90% of the deals that get talked about don't get done, you want to limit your energy on the ones that, that aren't getting done. Great. So, Boris, earlier in the evening, we talked a little bit about holiday which you were an 
investor in and uh, a board observer for. And that was an interesting one timing-wise because the company wasn't going out to be bought. It was kind of between rounds. The company didn't have to exit. Does that situation or others give you a sense or a measure of when the right time to sell the company is? You really want me to get myself in trouble here, don't you? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the right time to sell a company, and this is one person's view, is at that point where both founders and investors agree that an offer that's on the table um, and the buyer that is making that offer are a good cultural fit and that the price is the best price that you're going to be able to get um, at that particular time and that that particular time is the right um, time to sell. Meaning, if you're growing 30% a year and you've got an offer on the table that's giving you a four times multiple, then it's probably not the right time to sell because if you're going to make 30% more next year and you're only getting a four times multiple, you're going to do a lot better next year. Um, so it really is deal dependent. In my mind, there is no such thing as the best time to sell the company. There is the right offer from the right company at the right time for both founder and Susan, your experience as an entrepreneur growing and selling a company, how does that impact your lens as an investor? Are you, are there certain things you're not falling for anymore? Do you have a different perspective? <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> there are a lot of those things. Um, well, I guess one of the things um, is, we talked a little bit about this, Todd. So one of the things I'm doing now is I'm working um, with private equity owned companies um, and helping to grow uh, their sales operations into a real forecastable pipeline and process. And we know that adds value. That's one of the reasons why um, I do that kind of work now because I realize how much how much value um, that creates in small businesses. I mean, it's one of the three things I think that really is lacking and it, it, um, it's one of the three reasons why small businesses have trouble scaling. It's this lack of um, forecastable sales pipeline. So. Um, from an investor perspective, I also look at that, but um, that's what I'm doing in my work today as well. So, Morris, maybe this will just be a softball here. But many of the decks we see have an exit strategy slide in them. And they're probably, like any other slide, they're there because people think they need to be there, they want to be there. But do you get any value whatsoever from seeing and hearing how an entrepreneur is thinking about that? The only thing terrifies me more than an exit slide in an investor deck is the words FDA in an investor deck. <laughs> <laughs> and think Charlie's choking on her food in the back. Right? <laughs> Indeed. I agree. <laughs> um, no, I mean, you, you, you knew what my answer was going to be before you asked it on that one because we've had this discussion many times. Um, I really do not want to invest in companies where the CEO's goal is to sell in some set of time. I want to invest in companies where the founder's goal is to change the world and build the greatest company that can be invested. And to be perfectly honest, I really don't want to invest in companies where the lead investor has a three-year timeline and little or no flexibility. Um, because, you know, as you might have gathered from my last answer, there is no ideal time to sell. You don't know where the time, when the best time to sell is going to be. And in my mind, the most valuable thing you can get when you invest is optionality to make that decision when you want to make that decision. Okay. One more question here, then we'll open it up to the uh, audience. This question is for anyone or everyone who, who wants it. So you, you need luck in this business, right, and, and timing. And you know, we've been fortunate uh, at North Coast because we've had an opportunity twice this year to write checks back to uh, our investors with uh, Hology and OnShift. And there's, uh, I think, an interest in taking advantage of 
the energy and momentum in building upon uh, the successes that we're seeing uh, in many of the companies and successes that you've all mentioned. So as we think about this as an ecosystem in terms of trying to deploy more capital, more brain power, more experience to try to rinse, wash, repeat as much as we can, learn from the mistakes that we've all made and continue to make, but to, to build more of an ecosystem so that there can, we, we're going to need a much bigger stage to have this conversation next time. What should we, Royal We, be doing? <laughs> Supporting our founders. Um, I mean, I think we need, we need to do more of this, obviously, I think, um, and I'm going to go back to building, you know, always focusing on building processes in our businesses, making them more valuable. Um, you know, the founder going out and selling something to his friends isn't scalable, so um, we have to replace the, what they call the circle of, the circle of loyalty with the circle of confidence, right, within these businesses. We need people who know how to integrate. And we need to get rid of a little bit of the Midwest modesty. We really should talk about it a little more. We know in this room that, that there have been some returns uh, already from, from those businesses. But I dare say, if you walked out and asked anybody on the street, they wouldn't know those names. And the unfortunate thing is, I think there's a lot of money and there's a lot of expertise captive in the Cleveland market that, that isn't at the table because they don't know it can be done here. And I don't mean that negatively. It's just uh, it's, 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 it's a Silicon Valley thing, right? Or it's something they're not experienced about. And I think we could do a far better job of, of marketing this. I have gnashed my teeth about this a little bit, too, because we don't have the obvious uh, outlet. But, but it might be the regular column in Cranes, for better or worse, right? Um, on, uh, on, on Midwest investment or something like that. I, I think we just don't, we are not creating a community of people who know that this is happening. Great. So we'll have time for a couple questions from the audience. We'll make our final request and plea for feedback on your feedback forms and remind everyone that you do have to be here to win the bottle of Angel's Envy, which has been staring everyone in the face here. So questions? Michal? So you know, we work with a lot of entrepreneurs, young, not necessarily in age, but in experience. And one of my concerns, and we've talked about has been that they really do come and present thinking all we want to hear about is the exit. The deck, it's not the last slide on the deck, it's the only slide on the deck. Or they walk in and and I fully agree with, with the panel and, and Morris as you've been saying that I prefer to see companies that want to grow for the sake of what they're building, what they're producing, what they're innovating. And if the exit comes, that's great. But that is not getting relayed to the entrepreneurs. And I'm very interested in your thoughts. I have some of my own, of course, but how to get this into our ecosystem. They're, either they're watching too much TV or they're believing too much of the media that all we want to hear about is exits, but we're just not getting that across. And I think we really need to, for all our sakes, as investors, as entrepreneurs, and as people in this ecosystem. So uh, I'd love to even get a panel together on that, focusing how we can educate but I'd be very interested in your thoughts on, on how to do that in the short term. And, and mo at least in my experience, most first-time entrepreneurs who are who have not investigated in investment that well don't have an exit slide. But we train them that way, right? The Airbnb deck, the first Airbnb deck, which you can go download, it gets passed around as an example. Uh, there are three West Coast law firms, and I have each of their th that specialize in early stage, and I have each of their. This is a good example deck. And, and each of them has about 10 slides, and the last slide in every one is the exit slide. And you give that to a founder, and they go, All right, what does this mean? And then you have to educate them on it, and they know it's an unnatural act, and you tell them it's got to be in the deck. And everybody is telling them that has to be in the deck. Not everybody. Uh, yeah, right. So, I mean, I mean, I, I, mean Hal, I think you're right. I think, I think there's a re-education that needs, that needs to happen if we don't want them to think they're on a treadmill that says in three to five years, you have to produce this, this exit. And, and by the way, I do want to acknowledge we're not Silicon Valley. I'm happy to be in Cleveland. I want to be in Cleveland. 
I don't think I'm in Silicon Valley. It may be possible to put somebody on a treadmill in Silicon Valley because there's so much froth and there's so many dollars out there and there are 10 other people in the room who might acquire you. I don't think we have that luxury and it's far better. And by the way, Cleveland has a history. We exist as a city for building shareholder value over decades, right, with real productive businesses. I think it would be fair to say to the Cleveland entrepreneurial community and, and uh, to, to, sorry, to join Charlie in saying <laughs> to the Cleveland entrepreneurial community, don't be confused, right? You, you are there to build shareholder value and you're gonna, you're gonna build a great business. And by the way, you're gonna build a great board who's gonna help you understand when opportunities exist and whether those opportunities are, should be taken by the founders and by the investors. I don't think we should put all the blame on the investors. I think there is this Hollywood kind of um, image that founders have that they're going to leave their 40 hour a week job to work 80 hours a week and to get very, very rich. And the reality is that in a portfolio of 100 companies, you're going to have one or maybe two companies where that happens. And typically, it's not the one with the first time founder. It's the one with the, the third time founder who had a sideways, exit, a sideways exit first and made nothing because it all went to the preference stack of the, uh, the greedy investors who were there. And then they had a second um, exit where they learned about from the, from the preference stack from the previous deal not to do the deal that way. And they made a little bit of money. And then the third one, where they finally hit it and put the team together and understand that due diligencing their investors and preserving optionality is what really is going to make them happen. So I think, you know, a couple of the things that we got to do is to, number one, getting an exit that's sideways is not a failure, and it's okay to try and to, and to have outcomes other than 100x. I've reinvested in many founders who didn't have a two or three or even one and a half ex exit the first time. Um, and I think it's important to be able to convey to founders, especially young ones, they're probably not going to get rich on the first one or the second one. See. Yeah, I would just reiterate, I mean, you know this already, I think this is what you were alluding to is that, um, you know, it's the generation that expects the, the quick right, the quick exit. And also they've been they've been exposed to all of these ridiculous valuations, you know, that they've seen in the market over the last few years. So um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll defer to your comments about Silicon Valley. I think that's a, a good one to, to end on here. I think our only remaining job is to uh, thank all of our panels and to give away this bottle. And I think we have a process to do so unbiased process. Ah, okay. So, what we're going to do is have Sam, you pick a number between 1 and 48. Morris, you're going to identify that individual. And Susan, you're going to announce it. So every eyes are on this. We want the appropriate governance in place. 148. 24. Analyst men. Oh, Charlie Stack. Oh. That's okay. I was supposed to say Charlie sorry, Stack. <laughs> I have trouble following you. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Did that, right. I get it right? Yep. Okay. Panelist men. <laughs> that's what I said. What? As much as I really like Hazel. Okay. Pick another number. Pick another number. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 I get a drink, though. Lawrence Palena. Larry Palena. Larry Palena. As usual, as a board member, Charlie corrected the mistake, my mistake. Yes. All right, well, thank you to everyone again. We hope we'll see you at the September 26th North Coast Angel Fund meeting at Shaker Country Club. And then again on December 4th for the final education event of the year. Thanks, everyone.